uh, continuing with VLSI processing, this the silicon oxi oxidation section. Uh, we're looking at uh, the growth of oxide layers on a wafer surface, so this typically is silicon dioxide. And this little schematic over here sort of shows how that would take place. Here's the bulk silicon. Uh, here's some uh, oxygen that's coming in uh, either from oxygen uh, itself, an oxygen molecule or water or something else that's carrying oxygen, exposed at high temperature. And then the this basically the surface will react with the oxygen and you'll form a silicon dioxide layer. So typically at high temperature, something that carries the oxygen or brings it in, the silicon dioxide consumes silicon from the wafer. So the basic basically the growth of the dielectric on the surface is is into and on the surface. A silicon dioxide could also be grown at lower temperatures, perhaps as low as 700 degrees C. This uh, changes the rate of growth considerably because the temperature is way down, but it may be required to grow some high quality di uh, dielectrics. And uh, certainly for the ultra thin uh, SiO2 films where you have to have a lot of control over the thickness itself. So high quality SiO2 is an insulating layer for uh, typically for uh, the, the gate dielectric. So these are grown from thermal oxidation. For thicker oxides, you could grow them from a, a wet oxide. Uh, typically not going to be as high a quality, but could be very thick films grown quite quickly. Uh, gate oxides uh, are typically grown at lower temperatures and you have much better uh, thickness control and slower rates. And they're grown in uh, monolayers, although I don't know what the, the rate would be. Uh, the thinnest oxides, you, nitrogen are at, is added, uh, basically slows the growth rate, better control again, and has some other desirable properties such as reducing leakage current and reducing penetration of other dopants which may be present. So basically after the oxide is grown it's subject to a, a nitrogen plasma and that would be generated by uh, RF or microwave and basically that releases nitrogen ions and they can react on the surface. Uh, the gate dielectrics uh, tend to get thinner as the MOSFETs get smaller. That was a consequence of our earlier uh, scaling laws that we looked at. And we, what we basically end up with, we want the current drive to increase. We need the capacitance to increase. And if this is the expression for the capacitance over here, um, then we have to make our, our oxide, thinner, uh, oxide thickness thinner. But you're running out of atoms, so that's no longer becoming a possibility. Uh, just to get a perspective where we are again, there's a chip. There's a wafer that it, uh, one of the die was diced up and shoved into that chip. And on that chip we had uh, a number of different layers and uh, at a very small layer we might have a, a, an instance here where we're looking at a, a gate dielectric. So more recently the uh, in VLSI processing the, the silicon dioxide is being replaced by uh, something which is considered a high K oxide. And basically, as we talked about before, the replacement of SiO2 uh, is required because it's getting too thin. And as a consequence, new materials are needed with higher permittivity. And uh, that is a result, direct result of our scaling arguments that we looked at earlier, where we have our, our uh, MOSFET current, for example. And we have a relationship between the oxide thickness, the relative permittivity, and, and C-ox. And so what we want to have drive to increase. We'd like to have T-ox go down. We can no longer have T-ox go down, so we want to push uh, the relative permittivity up. So there are some dielectrics that can be used, aluminum oxide, uh, zirconium dioxide, and hafnium oxide. All probably very difficult to deal with, but we'll look at pictures later on how they're manufactured. In any event, they look like they're physically thicker and electrically thinner, so the devices can actually be made thicker and they have the same characteristics as a, a thinner uh, SiO2 layer, for example. So with respect to the thin film deposition, uh, some materials are used in this uh, fabrication process from the gas phase. They might be the insulating dielectrics used between various conducting layers, so there it's called an interlayer dielectric. A wide variety of deposition techniques exist. The simplest is probably atmospheric chemical vapor deposition. And there's a picture of a furnace over here and uh, basically some wafers going into the furnace. So in this particular case, it perhaps is, is at, at uh, atmospheric pressure or it could be at a lower pressure. And uh, that's a newer technique, which is called low pressure chemical vapor deposition, which gives you better process control. So this one over here looks like it's uh, just uh, in atmospheric pressure. This one over here looks like you're able to use it at low pressure. So the wafers typically are, are stacked in a batch, uh, groups of three or four furnaces, and uh, in, in this particular case, that low pressure CVD would have been used if you're depositing polysilicon. Uh, wafers heated in the furnace in the presence of, let's say, silane or, or silicon tetrasilane, and then you'd be able to grow a silicon polysilicon layer. 
So a lot has to depend on the choice of the gas, the temperature and parameters, and, and uh, certainly lots of material processing to going into building these thin films. And we haven't even talked about patterning them, but this is just, you know, depositing a thin film on the entire surface at this point in time. So here's a picture of sort of the wet, the the batch-based processing in a, in a thermal oven. So here's a batch of wafers, and here's a bunch of furnaces, and here's the wafers heading into the furnace. Uh, more recently, the chemical vapor uh, deposition reactors tend to have gone vertical. Uh, some of the processing reasons for that was basically just to, to reduce the footprint of the machines on the fabrication at the fabrication facility. Um, other types of uh, changes more recently have been uh, moving from batch to uh, single wafer processing, and some of the reasons for that would be cost as usual, and you have a, an increased integration requirement for manufacturing. And so what that may end up meaning is that you want to be able to have a, a process which is very complicated where in addition to regular old like CMOS kind of circuitries, you may want to add something like an embedded DRAM. So the processing basically has to integrate what used to be used for processing your circuits and what's now used for and what was used for processing your DRAMs and then integrate those together. So this is sort of what's known as process integration. You have a series of processes which are lumped together sequentially and hopefully you get the desired results. So you've gone to a single wafer but multiple chamber platforms and there's a couple pictures of them over here. So each of these chambers, you know, the wafer is never really exposed to the atmosphere and gets processed in each one of these depending on what the, the layer is that's being deposited. Uh, here's a simple example of a schematic of a multiple chamber type. It had some in situ uh, uh, pre-cleaning, so that would have been some plasma that's cleaning the surface. Uh, deposition of some uh, type of hemispherical grain silicon, so maybe that's polysilicon. And as points out, that's used in making a DRAM capacitor. And then, then the capability of doping N-type or uh, N-type silicon using uh, the gas phosphine. So phosphorus doping the, the silicon N-type. And then some nitrogenation step for either silicon or an oxide. A uh, very interesting part of uh, VLSI processing is plasma deposition. And uh, it's this is just a little overview of uh, what deposition or reaction looks like. It's an important technique and it can be done at low temperature. A wide variety of plasma techniques exist and you can certainly Google plasma processing. You'll see a bunch of them uh, if you even look at the images, quite interesting. Uh, basically, it assists in the decomposition of the gas as our source material. Uh, the plasma itself is a neutral gas uh, discharged with equal number of electrons and ionized atoms or molecules. So electrons have been ripped apart from the uh, molecules and, and the, the molecules are ionized and the electrons also have a charge, but overall it's neutral. Uh, it can be generated by a variety of excitation techniques, typically ranging from RF to, to microwave and typically generated in a vacuum uh, system at low pressure. And one of the reasons for that is it allows the gas to break down more easily, just as you see with a, a neon tube uh, signs that are, you know, uh, the bar is open kind of sign. Anyway, during deposition, the desired gases are leaked into the vacuum chamber, perhaps a constant flow and pressure, and then you end up building a, a thin film. So here's the plasma, and here's the substrate you want to coat, and the thin film is grown by virtue of the fact that you've released some of the, the uh, constituents of the surface from the the uh, gas that was uh, containing a, or carrying basically the, the atom that you want to perhaps deposit on the surface. And here's in-class uh, assignment, what is special about 13.56 megahertz perhaps. If you don't know, you could look that up and you certainly see that in this type of a situation you might even see 2.45 gigahertz uh, depending if it's uh, used a uh, microwave plasma. So at this point in time, we'll probably take a quick break in a minute, but this is just the picture of what a plasma might look like. So here was perhaps the bottom plate of an RF and the top plate of an RF. Uh, the plasma being generated in here, so it looks like you know a neon sign, as I mentioned before. And here's uh, something down here that's being coated with perhaps a thin film or interacting in any event with the, uh, the ionized gas from the plasma. And at this point in time, we'll take a break.